Good morning and welcome to Grant Thornton's head office here in Ireland on City Quay overlooking the Custom House and the International Financial Services Centre. My name is Joe Lynham and I'm the News Talk Business Editor. And for the next 50 or so minutes, we're going to digest what was given to us by the ministers, Michael McGrath and Pascal Donoghue, yesterday in the budget. And if you're watching in the Bahamas or Bermuda, I hope you're sleeping well uh, over there because it's still probably still warm. It's certainly autumn has arrived here in Ireland. I just wonder whether it is autumn in financial terms as well. We have a panel... We have two panels, and the first panel is going to talk about the tax implications, and the second panel will talk about the bigger macroeconomic picture. Um, so let's get straight into it. Uh, we've got about 23 minutes to talk about the tax implications, uh, and with me to discuss that is Jarlath O'Keefe, partner, tax partner with Grant Thornton. Hello, Jarlath, do you want to give a wave? Mary sure. Moran uh, is also a tax director. Uh, hello, Mary. And Peter Vale is also a tax partner. Uh, quite a few tax partners here. Uh, thank you to you both. Can I start with you, Peter Vale? How significant would you say the changes to the R&D tax credit were for small companies, medium-sized companies? Yeah, good morning, Joe. Um, yeah, and th there weren't that many specific measures in the budget for, for businesses in the corporation tax front, but the R&D tax credit change, the increase from 25 to 30 percent, is significant. It had been, had been flat, but actually quite late, quite late in the day. And it is very welcome because... It tends to incentivize stickier jobs. So jobs you know, linked to innovation, they tend to be stickier, less mobile than perhaps other jobs. So I think that's really important. Mm. And importantly, Joe, it's not, this isn't just aimed at multinationals. This is aimed at small businesses too. And there are some other changes in the R&D front as well for smaller businesses, specifically enabling them to get back cash up front quicker. That's mm. gone from 25,000 to 50,000. So that's, that's significant from a cash flow perspective. And like, for the economy, like, the R&D tax credit is expensive. It pays out about a billion a year, so it is expensive for the exchequer. But there's lots of work done to see, look, you know, is it value for money? And it is. It, it's a, it's is a key it easy relief. to measure, though, whether it's value for money? How do you measure it? Well, is it easy to measure? No, it is. Yeah, yeah. well, the, 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 the department has done it and they've concluded that it is, yeah. that we get more out of it than, um, than it costs. And I suppose, importantly, you know, it, we've less control over a corporate tax regime now. Yeah. Know, we're very susceptible to what others want to do with, with our regime, in effect. Geordie Credit is one of the few things we have control over. Yeah. So anything we do have control over, we need to make sure it makes us as, as attractive as we can. Okay. Uh, and the territorial regime changes to that? Yeah, sort of on a, on a similar footing. Um, we're one Explain of the, that to us uh, yeah, for those so, that aren't familiar with that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's maybe a little bit early for it, but basically it's to exempt dividends that are coming back from foreign subsidiaries up to an Irish holding company. And it doesn't generally... So we, we operate a credit regime. So you get a credit in Ireland for that foreign tax. Generally means, because we have a low tax regime, you don't pay any more Irish tax. But you've got to do a lot of complex calculations. Most, practically all other European countries just exempt those dividends. So it just makes us a little bit more friendly. Uh, and brings us for, into line then. It does. And for some reason, we were reluctant to do it for years. And finally, and there's a lot of dragging of its feet on this, but the department said, OK, we will bring this in, but it's going to be next year before it comes in. So we won't, we won't see it this year, but we will see it next year. So it's, look, it's another, it's another you know, string to a bow in terms of being an attractive regime from a corporate tax perspective. So it's a positive. Jarlath, can I bring you in and ask you about the extension uh, of the VAT regime for electricity and gas? It's extended, uh, it's going to stay at 9%. Uh, for another year or so. Is that a good thing, or given the fact that electricity prices are coming down? It, it is a welcome thing, and I think it's inevitable that uh, the Minister was going to extend it for the 12 months, given the fact that he's also introducing measures for release in relation to our bills, so he wouldn't want to take, give it on one hand and take it away on another. So it, it is a welcome change. Uh, there, there weren't a lot of changes in relation to indirect taxes and VAT in particular in relation to uh, the budget. Uh, there was the extent or the, the, the increase in the thresholds for people who have to register for VAT. It's gone to 40,000 for services, 80,000 for goods, marginal increase. And I think that's... It's nearly twice that in the UK. It's it is that. And I think, I think, I think we're, we're, we're dictated by the EU in that you can't increase it by... You can only increase it by a certain small percentage. So for the last 15 years, we haven't even bothered to do that. So in a way, it's a welcome change, but a, a really marginal change. Um, there was some uh, movement in relation to applying a zero rate to books or e-books and e-audio books, mm -hmm. which, is, which is welcome. And there was also a change in relation to the zero rating now of solar panels into schools. It was introduced last year into residential uh, houses and now they've introduced that, which is 
obviously a, a shout out to the the climate, uh, environment, etc. And as someone who installed solar panels this year, I was shocked to discover that I would have to declare the micro energy that I would earn from what little bloody sunlight we get in this country. But that's been raised. That's been raised. Well, it, yeah, it has. Yeah, yeah. So you you can earn up to four hundred euros and before you have to declare it. Exactly. Okay. And I don't know how much you earned last year, Joe, but if, if you're getting that. This year, I only installed it on the wettest day of the year, okay. Jarrett, okay. in August. So we got sweet FA, uh, which is a technical term. I don't want to get into no, jargon no, too no, much. No, 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 uh, no, it's um, a tax technical term. Mary, understand. can I bring you in on the personal taxation side of things? We all should end up a little bit richer next year. Hi, Joe. Yeah, no, we will. Um, the standard rate band increased by two thousand euro, up to forty two thousand. So that's the how much you can earn at the twenty percent rate. Is that regarded as index linked after the huge inflation we saw last year? It, it kind of is. The increases actually went up by about six percent this year, which right. seems to be in line with what they're saying. They're saying about five point two five was or the inflation the average. rate for yeah, this year. Yeah, twenty three. So um, they changed the USC as well, which was very welcome. Um, they cut it from four and a half to four. Which is the first the time they've rate. touched it in five years. So that was quite welcome. It's nice to see. This that is the temporary tax now, isn't it, that we're talking oh, yeah, about yeah. <laughs> from a decade ago? The temporary tax before they, they were going to relook at PRSI and, yeah. and, and redo that. But uh, no, the temporary tax, um, I suppose if you look at a middle income uh, family earning gross about 90,000, from the USC side solely, they're going to be paying less of 330 euro a year. Mm -hmm. And then if you take the same family overall with all the tax changes, um, you're talking about 1,534 a year extra in their pockets. So it's not too bad. So it's, it's regarded as a progressive budget in yeah. the sense that it will take proportionately less from the less well off, mm -hmm. and slightly proportionately more from the better off. Yeah, and you can see that as well with the USE, the 2% bond. Um, as we expected, was increased to be in line with the minimum wage as well. So Okay, so yeah. it's up to about 20, 27,000 euros or That's something right, like that. Yeah. Um, someone very wise on your, among your team said that uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, the, the amount that you retained from your gross salary was uh, 50, 58%, was that 58%? Whereas now... Mm -hmm. um, 52% of your money will be lost if mm -hmm. you are a medium to high income earner. That's right. Was that addressed in any way? Um, there's, again, the half percent change in the 4% bond of the USC. And then with the PRSI, they've announced that they're increasing it by 0.1% mm -hmm. um, across all PRSI rates from October next year. So, Is that um, for employers and employees? They haven't specifically said, but the fact that they've said all PRSI rates, it would seem so, but we'll wait to see what, we, what comes out in the So that will bill. cost companies? It would cost companies and employees, yeah, yeah. potentially. And I think, Joe, that's, like, that's an important point. Because the, the marginal income tax rate back before the financial crash was 43.5%. Hmm. It's now 52%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We used to have budget speeches where the government of the day would talk about, oh, let, let's try, because they remember, that's all a result of the temporary USC hikes, yeah. and the government, the, the budget speech would always allude to, we're going to try and bring that down over the next years. Mm -hmm. We haven't even seen that in the budget speech for, I don't know, five years now, mm -hmm. uh, which is disappointing. And it, it is a universal social charge, supposedly we're all paying it, yeah. and yeah. because it has that name, it, 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 they, maybe they would be slower to change that than they would PRSI. It, or, I mean, as you say, it's been around for 13 years. Well, look, it, it's a tax. Yeah. It, it, it's, How many it's taxes an income tax, have been that's temporary? All. Yeah, well, yeah. well, this one has been uh, very temporary, yeah. um, or very permanent. It's, it's a permanent temporary. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any indication it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down. And that's, like, that is significant, I think, in terms of... Um, it comes back to the point again around trying to attract talent here and retain talent here. Mm. Like, people who... The, the higher earners tend to create jobs. Mm -hmm. They create wealth and they bring jobs with them. OK. Uh, you know, there's nothing to stop people moving and creating those jobs and wealth elsewhere. And unless, if you're, if 52% of your money, your income has been taken away, that's a significant deterrent to doing things here. And it's just disappointing there's nothing in the speech at all to allude to any reduction in rates. It's just, it's, it's gone off the table completely. Are you a fan of SCARP, which is the special regime whereby uh, overseas workers um, sent to Ireland would yeah. pay less income tax than the guy they might be sitting across the desk from? <laughs> That's a very pointed question. The SARP is, I think it's a valuable relief, and I am a fan of it, yeah, because it does bring, and it's only for a limited number of years, so it does, look, it attracts talent here, and you bring people here, 
from other jurisdictions, they tend to create jobs because it's that level you're talking about. Typically, exactly 150k more north. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is a break, and it's capped. It's a cap break. It's it's valuable. It basically because they're on an equalisation package, it's reducing the cost for the business. Mm. So it's encouraging the business to bring execs here, and they tend to then bring jobs with them. So yeah, I'm 100% a fan of it. Okay. Um, in terms of the finance bill, which will be published in the next few. Is it days or weeks? It's, it's exactly. only a few days. It's the 19th. 19th, yeah. 19th of mm. October, which is, is yeah. not long away. Do you think there'll be any surprises in that or has everything been leaked out that we need to know? Yeah, yeah most of it has obviously been leaked out. And typically, obviously, the finance bill just includes the, the it puts the, the budget on a legislative footing. But there are always surprises in there, Joe. Um, generally, Usually more nasty for, ones. Yeah, and generally it's more for the tax nerds, you know, it's more anti-avoidance provisions. Isn't that no. you, you guys? It is, I'm okay. afraid, yeah, I have yeah. To, hands up. But the thing about it is, we've brought in a raft of, you know, anti-avoidance measures, probably for the last 10 years. There's almost that much more to put in. Mm. But yeah, I, I think we still will st see some things. That are, there's another, but I can too technical, there's going to be a provision in there, we think, around outbound payments. About? Outbound payments. So it flows yeah. out of our, and generally, companies paying money out of Ireland. We have a very attractive domestic regime, treaty regime. You don't suffer any withholding tax. The department is looking at that and there's expected to be a new wave potentially of withholding taxes. And again, for businesses with outbound payments. Again, that's not good for Ireland. So we tend to want to be top of the class and be seen to be really good, mm -hmm. which is good because we'd only be seen as a tax haven. Countries and companies don't want to be associated with tax havens, but we want to be pro-business as well. It's navigating that line. Yeah. So I'm afraid we might go the wrong side of it, be seen to do too much to get the top marks from the EU, mm -hmm. as opposed to retaining that pro-business environment. And that, again, in the context of a less competitive corporate tax regime, because the 15% rate would be a bad thing. Of course, if there was a downturn, then uh, that could be a major problem because we will suddenly be a very expensive place to employ people. Um, we potentially will be, yeah. And we're not at the moment. We're still a compelling location, yeah. but we need to keep doing things to make that. Okay, case. Charlotte, can I bring you back in and, uh, and talk about cigarettes? Um, it's going to cost about 16 quid or more to buy a pack of 20. Now, I don't smoke, and most people don't smoke probably in this room, um, but is there a risk that that could encourage people to smuggle cigarettes because the cost of them for people will become punitive. Yeah, I think inevitably it, it will. Um, I heard this morning on, on, on your station that it's actually... 16, that's news talk, by the that's way. That's news talk, yeah. It's 16, 16.75 a packet of, for, of 20 cigarettes. So, yeah. And it's a higher increase this year of 75 cent than, than it was previously. Now, it's continually been 50 cent per year. So I think there is you know, a worry that the shadow economy will, will take over. You know, somebody smokes 20 a day, that's 120 euro a week that yeah. they'll have to fork out to buy them where they can buy them. How much was it economy. when you were smoking behind the bike sheds? When I was smoking them. behind the bike sheds, I wouldn't have had to pay for them. Okay, because you're so popular. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, so the shadow economy, I mean, we, we, every day I get an email from Revenue about some warehouse being raided and they're finding cigarettes and I, can't, I, I ignore it and all that stuff. But if they become, if it becomes a huge amount of fake cigarettes coming in, it becomes an issue. It, it becomes an issue and a twofold issue. One, because they're not garnering the revenue that they thought they were going to garner with the, the increase, but also if people are still smoking uh, in, in relation to, you know, smuggle cigarettes, it's still costing the, the you know, hospitals, etc., cetera, uh, the excess money that, that they're trying to, to cut back on. So it, it there will become a, uh, a price point where people can't afford to buy in, in shops and, and therefore they will automatically, those that still smoke will automatically go to the, the shadow economy. Now, uh, they did mention vaping in the budget. What, what was said? I think they were waiting for the EU to introduce legislation. They haven't done that. So they, they announced that by next year they will have legislation in place to uh, apply excise to vaping products. Okay. Uh, and there is talk about banning disposable vaping products, I think, as well. There is, there is that talk. Uh, uh, Oshin Smith wants to, do, wants to do that because a lot of young people, because they can't afford cigarettes, are buying these dis disposable vapes and we see the little plastic uh, containers on the roads. Uh, and, 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 and we do see a lot of that. We see a lot of what, what we'd see as school children age uh, smoking the vapes. So yeah. they have to do something to try and deter that. Yeah, it's a tough one really because you don't want them to take up cigarettes either, you know. But you don't, but, you know, I would imagine they were originally brought in as an alternative and, and to wean people off cigarettes, and these are people starting them that haven't smoked in the first place, so... 
something has to, to give. Mary Moran, can I bring you in on this? Uh, one of the more controversial announcements uh, yesterday was about landlords. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the very first thing that Piers Doherty from Sinn Féin said in his uh, response speech in the Dáil. He said, instead of being uh, a budget for renters, it was a budget for landlords. What did you make of the announcements, inducements to keep uh, small landlords with only one property mm -hmm. in the market? Um, well, I suppose it was helpful because there's been very little for landlords since the recession hit back in uh, 2008. So what they've done is they've brought in, it's called a, it's officially called the Rented Residential Relief, uh, affectionately known as the Landlord Triple Credit. Yeah. Um, so that is a credit at the standard rate of um, only for residential property, where you can get 3,000 in 2024 of your income at the 20% rate. So they get 3,000? Yeah, 3,000 euros, so yeah. at the 20% rate, so it's a credit. Okay. Um, they did note in the budget that, in the budget commentary, that uh, there'll be more details in the finance bill of how it's actually going to work. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, it's going to go up for the next four years to a maximum of 5,000. Yeah. Um, and there's a few conditions around it as well that you have to keep it in the market. Yeah. You can't take it out or there's a full clawback. There's not even a, a pro rata clawback, which they you usually can't, do. You must keep, keep it in the market the rent, for yeah. until 26 or something like that. Yeah, 26, 27, yeah. yeah. Um, is it going to work? Are people who suddenly find themselves landlords, sometimes you're an accidental landlord, you, you might yeah. inherit a property or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, is that going to work? Are people because sometimes the red tape involved with being uh, a landlord is heavy. Yeah, and I suppose um, you know, for a landlord, you're going to have to do an income tax return anyway. So it's easier to do it to, to make this claim rather than some of the other credits that have been given. Because I know the the government mentioned um, yesterday that they were going to start a a publicity campaign with revenue because there's so much that's not being claimed. People um, are afraid to go to revenue. The, yeah, they, they don't they want to upset the yeah. apple cart in case revenue find that they owe more money. Yeah, and uh, and it's happened to myself as well when you go in to claim do something. Do you dodge suddenly, much tax, Mary? I know. I, well, I try. I try not to. But uh, sometimes you do. You go in and suddenly you think you're getting some money back and there, there's something on your payslip that hasn't flowed through yeah. and uh, you're, you're left paying money where you thought you were getting something back. So I can see why... It's, people are afraid of it. Yeah. Um, I suppose with the landlords, it's, some, it's a credit that it'd be easy enough for them to, um, to, to, to make the claim uh, because they're, they're making a return anyway. But um, whether it's going to, to keep the one property landlord in the market, mm. I mean, I suppose every little helps. Um, it's 3,000 to 20%, 600 euro off your tax bill it isn't, isn't too bad. Do you know if you're talking whatever, wherever you're renting and what the market rate is. And does it depend on whether it's easy to claim back on? Does it depend on all sorts of other things? Because we have heard that renters find it difficult to get the rental credit because mm. they need to get so much information from the landlord mm -hmm. who they don't want to annoy, irritate or whatever. Well, yeah, with the rental credit is you need to have the RTB number for the property. RTB is Residential Tenancy Board. That's right. Um, Revenue do have an allowance where you can make the claim without the RTB number. However, you are supposed to provide it at some stage. Yeah. So if they come back and look for it, you haven't entered it, your rental credit can be disregarded and you will owe the money back. Which again, it, it's to try and tie in obviously so that they know what properties are being rented for how much and everything. Mm -hmm. I know it's an information gathering thing, um, but it does turn people off, especially if you do have a landlord who could be just difficult to get. It's not that they're trying to hide anything, it's just, you know, some people aren't great with their personal correspondence. And no, they're, they're not. You know, so, um, and the vast majority of landlords will be honourable and mm -hmm, do the right thing, but yeah. some will be unscrupulous. Yeah, you know. And, and that's, they'd say, well, I'm not giving you the number. If you want to continue living here, you'll, you'll bugger off. That's it, yeah. yeah. But even, Joe, even, I agree, Mary, but even if it was easy to claim for landlords, you know, landlords have a lot more to worry about, mm -hmm. I think, in the current climate, you know, higher interest rates, mm -hmm. rent pressure zones, there are lots of other reasons. So, like, a thousand euro max by 2026, I think is very little. Yeah. So I, mm -hmm. I didn't quite get the you don't comment think that work? this is a budget for landlords. I, I just don't think it's very much. I wouldn't have called it a budget for landlords at all. Like it's quite minor. But you understand scheme. that for political reasons, it, that's what Sinn Féin oh, are, are going to frame it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, but I think that's, I, I, I wouldn't that's see it job. as that at all. Yeah, it's, it is very modest. I don't see it really making, yeah. a tr you know, attracting a landlord to stay in the market. I can't see it doing an awful lot. Uh, Peter, while I have you, what did you make of the tax liaison committee? <laughs> Uh, supposedly set up to simplify and cut red tape for businesses. 
Yeah, it'd be great if we saw that, Joe, and, and it worked. Are you I mean, telling me that they won't set it up or that nothing oh, no, they will, will change? No, they will, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm part of TALC, so I think, and it's an initiative that we've, we've driven. Um, it's a question of whether the ideas that come out of TALC, and there's some really good ideas, whether they get taken up by revenue and by the department, and it's by the department ultimately, but heavily influenced by revenue. And there are loads of things that could be simplified. So it's just the appetite to actually do something. Um, is maybe one. Give us an example of the stuff that they can, uh, low hanging fruit when it comes yeah, to simpl simplification. Yeah, there's some easy enough things in terms of like CGT capital gains tax. There are two different mm -hmm. payment dates at the moment. And again, mm -hmm. why? Oh, well, if we were to change and you just did it on the one day, it'd be a cash flow hit. It's a very modest cash flow hit. It's probably a couple of hundred million max in one mm -hmm. year. And at the moment, the exchequer can take that and it would make things hugely more simple for many taxpayers. So things like, there are lots of things like that whereby you can make it a lot simpler for revenue as well and for taxpayers and cost the exchequer nothing. So there are other examples which will definitely be looked at. And look, I'd be you know, optimistic that I'm an optimist. I'm a worrier, but I'm an optimist as well. <laughs> that, that they will be embraced by the department. But historically, we haven't always seen that. You know, we've just seen maybe a paranoia in revenue that there's something else going on. People are looking at this for another reason as opposed to potentially embracing it for what it is, which is just more simplicity, less cost, less red tape. I mean, tax, I think we looked at it, the tax return now is about 52 pages. Yeah. For companies, it was 11 pages 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There's much more complexity in the system. So anything we can do to take that away has to be welcomed. It sounds as if uh, the, the taxman needs a cultural change and the appreciation of wealth creators and the appreciation of entrepreneurs and people who do start up businesses uh, that there is a bit of a suspicion within well, civil servants on, on that group. Taxman has to do their job, which is to collect tax revenues. Based um, on the law. Yeah, and, and we can't expect maybe revenue to wear the green jersey, and I don't think to do, and they have to police the regime. But I think you can do that and also be a pro-business and pro-entrepreneur, going back to what we talked about earlier. Mm. I think you, you can do both. And look, and they do do a good job. I think maybe just a little bit more they can do on both sides. Jarlath O'Keefe, could indirect taxes be simplified with this? Tax liaison committee? They, they, they could be simplified. I, I don't think they will. What's coming down the tracks in terms of indirect taxes, the whole VAT in the digital age, which has to come in by 2027. Mm. So we'll have to see e invoicing and, and real time reporting. Now, I don't think that will happen by 2027. Some European countries, such as France and Portugal, are ahead of the curve and ahead of us. Others, such as France, were supposed to introduce e invoicing by January next year, and I've put it off to the middle of 26. So I think that 2027 deadline won't be met, but a lot of the revenues time will have to be taken up by putting the processes in place that they're ready for this. Mary, same question for you on the direct taxation or personal taxation side of things. What can be improved? Yeah, well, as, um, as Peter said, the, the CT return is, uh, the corporation tax return is 50 odd pages. The income tax is 48 uh, currently. Um, it's a lot of boxes to be ticked. Um, and yeah, it would make it would make things an awful lot easier for the taxpayer. It would also make things an awful lot easier for the tax advisor when you're doing the return. Um, the the point that Peter made about the CGT, that I think that changed back with the recession as well, just to bring the cash flow pieces in. Um, it used to be that you did your CGT, CGT payment on the same date you're doing your income tax payment. Mm. Um, whereas now we have the 31st of October, the extended deadline for income tax is the 15th of November this year. The For CGT, for any disposals between 1 January and the 30th of November this year, has to be paid by the 15th of December. So it's multiple dates. It's just multiple dates. You know, we're not our client's favourite person when we're constantly harassing them about these deadlines yeah. and more, you know, more things to... to uh, to fill out and, and send on to revenue. So it would make it easier, it would make it more practical as well, just on that side. Yeah. You know, but as I said, for, like 48 pages is, is a lot to... In to some focusing. Eastern European countries, the tax return is a two-page document. Mm -hmm. In other words, you basically say, do you have any additional income? Mm -hmm. If so, yes, what? Mm -hmm. Next question. Yeah. Anyway, on that, on that hope, that uh, tax can be simplified. Mm. And I think Jarlett is scoffing because he says that's <laughs> it's not going to happen in his lifetime. Uh, thank you all very much, all three of you. Uh, we're going to swap out the panels now, but thank you very much. Um, you guys can head back and uh, Thanks, head to the bar or wherever you want to go. <laughs> uh, Jarlath O'Keefe, a uh, tax partner, uh, Mary Moran, um, tax partner, and Peter Vale, also amazingly, a tax partner. And I'm going to invite straight away the next uh, recipients to arrive in. Thank you very much. Hopefully we have Andrew Webb. Hopefully we have Jim K. 
Kelly, uh, Una Ryan, and Pascal. Are you all there? Say on shot if you're, if you're there. Unshot. Good, you're all there, good. I think you're all mic'd up. Um, we are gonna have a little look at the broader picture now for, for the uh, backdrop, and any of you who are listening to uh, News Talk this morning would have heard me talking to Andrew about that very thing. So I'm gonna have to repeat some of the stuff for those very tiny minority, Andrew, that weren't listening to the show. Uh, this morning. I'm going to start with you. Andrew Webb is uh, the chief economist uh, with um, Grant Thornton. Andrew, what was the economic backdrop for this budget? Yeah, good morning. So I suppose globally, and in fact just yesterday, the IMF said that the, the global economy's limping along. Uh, I think that's a, a fair call, just with the inflationary context, and, and that's hanging around a bit longer than, than was hoped for. And now we have new challenges coming through. Uh, just in terms of you know, lots of skills challenges in, in, in our economy. Um, so the backdrop was a global economy that's, that's not going to post particularly strong growth next year, sort of sub 2%, uh, which isn't great. And then in our own economy, uh, ESRI talking about growth rates uh, this year of maybe 1.8% and next year of just, just under 25 So we're in that context where we are seeing growth, but it's, it's nothing you would be particularly excited about. Uh, we're also seeing, just from the, the tax revenues, you know, really positive overall picture on tax revenues, uh, but just that wobble in the last couple of months on the corporation tax returns that they've come in a bit uh, lower than, than expected. So that I'm sure would give some pause for thought as the, the ministers work through their numbers. Uh, still very positive and a, a good strong surplus, which allowed them to do plenty yesterday in the budget. Um, but the, the, the macro picture of the economy is, is here is one that doesn't look like it's going to grow particularly strongly over the next 18 months, two years. But let's not lose sight of the strong positives of uh, you know, the corporation tax receipts, the, the business performance to date, and the labour market's been particularly strong, and that, that has bolstered income tax returns as well. So. Yeah, I was talking to uh, John McCarthy from the Department of Finance. He's the chief economist in the Department of Finance and he said, yeah, there were headwinds and tailwinds exactly as you described there, the headwinds. Inflation hasn't gone away, you know. No. Um, and uh, there is a slight downturn on corpo receipts, but the tailwinds are full employment is, you know, and you, there's still a fair bit of uh, momentum in the economy. Uh, interestingly enough, the ESRI yesterday, uh, last week when we had them on the show, said that they thought GDP would shrink for the year 2023. <coughs> the department yesterday said that they think it'll be 2% this year for GDP and 2% next year. Now, GDP, we know, is a dreadful benchmark for the Irish economy. Yeah. Uh, but it goes to show you that it's such a dreadful <coughs> benchmark that the ESRI and the government can't even be on the same page whether it's negative or positive. Well, that's... You know, economic forecasters rarely land on the same number, so it depends who you ask at any point in time. I, I would take a view probably more aligned with, with uh, ESRI and, and where, the, where their view is, is going. So a shrinkage in GDP this year? Possibly, but it's such, I mean, it's, I, I really prefer to focus on the modified domestic demand MDD, and, yeah. and, and really you know, hone in on that. And also, I mean, just the, you know, the, the, what I call the economics of walking about. You can sense what's happening in the economy and we're doing lots of work in county councils. Do you do councils. a lot of walking about, Andrew? Well, I try to, you know, limousine? try to, you know, this, this doesn't happen naturally. This takes a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so, walking but, to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not often enough. But that, just that sense of what's happening and, you know, we're out all the time with clients and doing a lot of work on economic strategies at the minute for the county councils. And you're just hearing lots of, you know, it, it's, there's strong performance, um, labour market challenges, really struggling to get people to, to fill the roles, but just as well, their consumer sentiment has fallen pretty rapidly in the last couple of months. I think the effects of those interest rate increases and inflation still being around, plus now, you know, oil prices creeping back up, so mm. we're seeing that at the pumps. That's all weighing on the consumer, and the consumer drives so much of, of this economy in terms of hospitality and, services, yeah. and culture and services. So really a mixed bag at the minute. Okay, let's go to Pascal Comerford, who, who is a specialist uh, in corpo tax, corporation tax, Pascal. Um, there's something called Pillar 2. I have an idea what it is, but there will be some people who won't know what it is. Explain what we heard in the budget that might have been of news to those people who are unfamiliar with the OECD tax regimes. Thanks, Joe. Um, 
there wasn't very much mentioned. I think it got, it got pillar two and mentioned in passing yeah. in the context of the R&D tax credit and giving a little bit back to the businesses who would be paying more tax by way of pillar two, giving them Just a little bit of rebate. Just remind us what pillar but two yeah. is. But on, on pillar, pillar two is an initiative that the OECD um, has introduced um, on foot of a lot of tax, a lot of initiatives that they have been working on over the last 10 years following the financial crisis and the um, pressure on on businesses to clean up their tax acts mm. uh, and to be seen to be not availing of tax avoidance measures. So there's a lot, good a lot, corporate a lot of citizens. good corporate citizens. There was a lot of changes. There was BEPS, the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Initiative in 2013 and 15, mm -hmm. which brought in through, through certain changes, but not bringing, not, not changing the tax profile fast enough as far as the OECD and the EU and the UN. But it did get rid of the so-called double Irish. It did. It made, made, it made a, lot, a number of changes on tax treaties and kind of residency rules and so forth. So, and interest restri restriction rules were brought in and con control of foreign corporation rules, etc., etc. Pillar 2 and Pillar 1 are the next iteration of tax changes. And Pillar 2 is basically seeking to bring in a minimum corporate tax base for large corporations. So corp groups, multinational groups with a turnover above 750 million euro. Yeah. So we're not talking about the small SME sector. Of which there's Ireland, only a few dozen in Ireland. Over well, there's over 1,700. Um, subsidiaries earning. of those multinationals operating in Ireland and some of the biggest <coughs> ones who are paying the, the bulk of the corporate tax in Ireland and implying the bulk of the high paid kind of tech sector workers yeah. and pharma and so forth, um, they're all in scope. Um, so for them what it will mean is the 12.5% they were paying previously on their Irish taxable profits will now increase to 15%. And likewise any other jurisdictions around the world they will ha um, have to ensure that the profits are paying there so that the day of the tax haven or the low tax regimes even like Ireland have mm. um, is slowly being um, eked away as they're now being forced to bring up their effective tax rate. Not a whole lot in the scheme of things for, for Ireland, 12 and a half to 15, mm -hmm. but when they're already paying 24 billion in corporate taxes and that 2.5% two, two increase on those biggest taxpayers could amount to a additional uh, corporate tax receipts for Ireland in so the short you, term. You, yeah, in the short term. I mean, uh, there was an estimate that it would, it would cost potentially five billion uh, by hiking up the rates because some companies might move. You don't think that companies would move as a result of this new regime, the big ones? Well, so far we haven't seen any um, hints hints from those, those companies. Basically, the, the tax rate they get in Ireland, they, they, they've had a good deal for a number of years mm. uh, and the additional 2.5% is not major compared to what they might pay in the US or in a lot of their our European partners. Mm. So kind of this, and, and also more importantly, as has been the government policy for the last 20, 30 years, they have brought substance to Ireland. They have built big presences. They've, their European headquarters are in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So those sticky jobs, as Peter mentioned earlier, and the R&D jobs and so forth, yeah. are fixed in Ireland. And they're not going to make it overnight, make a decision to move those elsewhere. Okay, Intel, went with their newest um, investment is going to Germany as opposed to Ireland, but they've already invested, already they've opened. they've invested $17 billion in already. Fab 34. Yeah. I was at the opening of the plant and it is, wow. Exactly, yeah. So we're not going to win everything, no. but we're still winning our, as can be seen by the latest results from the IDA, we're still winning our fair share. Uh, and just, go, just to complete the circle, Pillar 1, of course we did start with Pillar 2, which we shouldn't have, but Pillar 1 is? Pillar 1 is um, going after probably the, the, the much bigger corp groups, the tw groups with a turnover above 20 billion. Okay. And the perception is that a lot of those groups who have, and maybe the social media ones, companies would be one of the, the, their biggest targets, mm. where they have customers all over the world, but they're centralizing their profits in a certain few number of jurisdictions. Including Ireland. Including Ireland. Um, and basically the attempt, that they're, what, the, what the OECD are attempting to do is to make those profits reportable in the countries where the customers are. So, for example, if you are Meta and you have 10 million subscribers in Germany um, and versus 2 million in Ireland, a, a bigger proportion of the profits will go, to, will go to Germany versus Ireland. But making that work um, practically and, finan and through their accounting and trying to find a measure that is agreeable to everybody is very difficult. And also, um, Ireland still has a veto on all tax measures within the European Union. Within the European Union, but this is an OECD, yeah. so this is a global tax initiative. And is it a voluntary scheme, Pillar 1? No, it, when it comes in, it, it, it will be there. Um, each country will need to implement it individually into their, into their local, local legislation. Okay. But what we have seen with a lot of the OECD measures in recent years is the OECD announces them, and this is the principle of it. The EU then comes along afterwards and implements a directive to give effect to it. Yeah. So then the, the EU member states have to actually implement it. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, Una Ryan, can I bring you in and talk about um, some of the capital gains issues that we mentioned in the budget? There was a, a, a new reference to angel investors, quite an important announcement actually, to those investors who want to invest in startups or early stage companies, often because the banks won't lend them the money. Tell us about what was announced. Yeah, so this was actually a very welcome relief. Um, it was, as you mentioned there, it was a relief for angel investors. So these are people who invest in uh, mainly startup companies. Um, and as you said, they can't get bank funding. So what is the relief? Basically, the relief says that if you invest in a startup and an innovative startup company, um, minimum though 10,000 that you have to put in, um, you can get a reduced rate of 16% CGT. When you sell out. When you sell out, yeah, that's key. How long do you need to be in? Um, so you need to be in for three years. It has to be in the form of shares. So it um, can't be a cash. Can't thing. be cash or loans is generally, sometimes yeah. you would see investors investing in companies through loans. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to be in the form of newly issued shares, um, three years. Um, and there is a lifetime limit of three million on the gains that you can avail of the CGT rate of 16%. It sounds on paper quite interesting, actually. It does sound really interesting, but I think the devil is in the detail. Um, is this, the, again, the finance bill? This is the finance bill. So we already have entrepreneur relief that gives you a million at 10%. Mm -hmm. We now have this um, angel investor uh, CGT relief that gives you um, gains at 16% subject to a lifetime limit of 3 million. And it'll be interesting to see how the various reliefs interact. Um, so again, as I said, devil in the detail. Uh, America has a strong culture of um, venture capital. We don't have it here in Europe. They tried it uh, with, you know, through the various different capital unions, uh, capital union stuff in the European Union. It hasn't quite changed the culture yet. It's gonna be a big ass to change people's minds uh, and companies t to say, well, I'm not even going to bother with the banks. I'm going to go to a, a pool of cash. Yeah, and I, but I suppose a lot of these, and it's specifically targeted at the, the the initial startup. They don't really have much luck with banks in any event here. Yeah. Banks um, just don't take risks. No, um, and this is the thing. I suppose the angel investor is someone who's willing to take that risk mm -hmm. and who who really does see the viability of the company and that this will... And the tax advantages, potentially. And the tax advantages, potentially. Yeah. Now, while I have you, Una, uh, can we talk about vacant homes tax yep. and the residential zoned land tax? Yeah. Uh, again, they were announced yesterday. Yeah, Changes. so relatively new taxes for anyone that's not familiar with them. Um, the vacant homes tax, um, when introduced last year, was three times the local property tax. Right. Um, um, so if they, the local property tax was 1,000 a year, that'd be 3,000? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, in addition to your local property tax. Yeah. So what it means is that if you've got a home that's vacant for um, more than 30 days in the year, so Joe, you and your wife own a holiday home in Clare. Would that we did. Oh. We, Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, news talk has you way too busy and yeah. you don't make it down. You might make it down only two weekends in the year. Mm. That's potentially cost by the vacant homes tax. Yeah. Um, it's a self-assessment tax. So, um, and the whole idea of the vacant homes tax is to stimulate the housing in Ireland, mm -hmm. to encourage people to sell their houses if they're not using them on a regular basis or to rent them out. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose yesterday's announcement is that it's now gone up to five times. Um, the local property tax. So it's, it can be punitive. So it's, it's it a carrot punitive. and stick. Correct. And do you think it'll work because there are so many homes left unoccupied uh, all around the country, and yeah. either derelict or just unoccupied? Um, I suppose, um, taking a step back, there's quite a number of exemptions, actually, with the vacant home tax. I think there's eight from last looking at the legislation. So that removes all of those properties in its entirety. Um, and then taken, well, you're now ex-holiday home, but if you realise I that don't have a holiday home in case oh. I said would that I had. <laughs> no, you know. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Lest that rumour get out there, by the way. <laughs> Hello to my friends in Bahamas. But taking that into the equation, you would probably make more of an effort now to utilise that. Yeah. Or it might do what it's intended to do and you go, oh, I'll just sell the house or I'll rent it out. Right. And therefore open up more housing units to the market. So you're a bit suspicious that it'll work no matter how big the stick is? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jim, residential zoned land Yes, excuse tax, me. Yeah, we didn't get into or that. Or very controversial tax. Yeah. Um, so this is, again, for those that don't know it, it's a new property tax. Um, and it's 3% on the market value of land that is zoned for residential use. 
Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of controversy built up around this um, because um, I suppose a lot of developers who had residential zoned land were automatically caught by this. Um, if they hadn't uh, started building fast enough, if they had planning permission and things were holding it up. Um, so they were, all their lands were automatically included on the local authority maps, mm -hmm. um, and which meant that they were within the charge to residential zoned land tax. And sometimes they take ages to start developing. Correct, you know? correct. Um, so there was a lot of um, lobbying to the local authorities um, to get these um, lands excluded. We also heard earlier in the year that farmers who had actually gotten a residential planning permission were now included in this as well. They were given the opportunity to remove themselves from the register. Um, and then they wouldn't be liable to the residential zoned land tax. So the government, I suppose, or the minister has recognised this and has given an, an extension to pay this tax by a year. So the first liability date was the February 2024 with a payment and return due in May 2024. So now I assume it's May 2025. Mm. And it's to give people an opportunity to uh, negotiate with the local authorities or get... The get their exemptions. It get their exemptions in place, correct. Thank you. Meanwhile, nothing gets built. <laughs> the hope is that everyone continues to build. Right. Okay. Thanks, Una. Uh, Jim Kelly, uh, can we talk to you about the employment taxes? Um, was there anything in this that an employer will feel, yeah, that's a tangible win for us? Um, <clears throat> Joe, I, I don't actually think so. Um, so, particularly small employers, now the, the increase in the minimum wage, for example, was well flagged ahead of the budget. We knew it was coming. Um, but smaller employers who, who you know, are already pretty tight with various business costs, uh, rent rates, etc., you know, are not going to be overly impressed with the fact that allied with the increase in the minimum wage, and we knew it was coming, the Low Pay Commission had recommended it, and there will be more to come. Auto enrolment also on its way. Exactly, and the increase in PRSI which yeah. is going to hit small businesses. October next year, isn't it? Correct. And yeah. again, that's, you know, the minister mentioned a roadmap, so it's the tin end of the wedge probably. Mm -hmm. There's going to be more. We do have a pensions time bomb, bomb that has to be addressed. So, you know, smaller employers who are struggling are probably not seeing an awful lot yeah. in this budget for them. Uh, there are some income tax concessions and their employees, you know, Leo Varadkar referenced a thousand euro for people. Um, so certainly, the employees will see an improvement in their pay package. But employers... But for the employers, I think the pressure is still there now. There is a new grant system, uh, which is going to be administered by local authorities, and you would hope that that would bring some relief. But, you know, if you're a typical small employer, you'll be a little bit suspicious about what am I going to see that's going to help me with the day-to-day -day business costs. Do you think... This is continuing a question that I put uh, previously to Peter. Do you think there's a cultural um, problem in this country whereby employers are seen as bad guys and everybody should be an employee? I think so, uh, potentially. I think um, that there's a suspicion and, and you know, revenue are, you know, we, POI modernization came in a few years ago. It was closely followed by a pandemic. Yeah. Uh, so real time tax around employment is something that revenue have been itching to get a grip on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they will do so. And I think that's gonna bring quite a lot, particularly next year in terms of scrutiny of employers and how they operate. You know, if you're trying to run a small business and, you know, you're paying your employees, you obviously want to keep your employees satisfied in terms of take-home pay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of pressure there. And I, I think you're right, there is a slight suspicion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the best will in the world, you're trying to keep the doors open, you're trying to keep your business alive, and you're yeah. trying to keep your employees in jobs. Yeah, and meanwhile, you have to pay all sorts of commercial rates and you have to pay, your, obviously, your VAT. Talking of which, debt warehousing was something that saved a lot of small companies during lockdown, during pandemic. They're going to have to start paying that now. Yeah, the debt warehousing scheme was, was very welcome. It was part of a suite of, of COVID measures that the government introduced, which were very welcome in, in the context of, you know, a pandemic. Uh, you know, none of us had seen this in our lifetime, so nobody knew exactly how to react. Mm -hmm. And to be fair to revenue, they, they, they administered did all quickly. of that and, and they acted very quickly and very efficiently. Um, the debt warehouse is still there. It's probably the last legacy piece now. And there's a huge amount of money in it. Uh, there's two billion in it there. Needs to be paid. And it's expected that about 25% of that is probably bad. You know? And will that mean that 25% of the companies who owe huge amounts of money to revenue could go to the wall? I suspect that's probably a conservative estimate because revenue are now charging interest on that debt. 
whereas in, initially in the debt warehousing phase there was no interest. Their phase payment arrangements have to be put in place by next May and the Collector General, your namesake Joe Howley, has been asking businesses to engage on this because there is a genuine concern that maybe quite a lot of this money is actually bad and quite a lot of businesses are now insolvent. Yeah. So it remains to be seen. To be fair, again, you know, Revenue are encouraging people to come forward, address the position that they're, they're, they're charging minimal upfront payments. Mm -hmm. So in the past, if you had uh, approached Revenue for a phase payment arrangement, you'd have to make maybe 20, 25% down payment uh, to get a phase payment. Yeah. They'll accept minimal down payments and they will relax the normal kind of burden of documentation that has to be provided to them to back it up. So they are actively encouraging businesses to come forward uh, and address the position and get these payment arrangements in place. Uh, so would you say there's a, quite a few zombie companies out there that are limping along and the insolvency numbers that we get once a quarter or whatever it is, they suggest the insolvencies are inching up but they're not back at pre-pandemic levels yet. Is that because of debt warehousing or is it the new... Uh, voluntary kind of, um, what's it called, the new uh, system to, to prevent companies having to declare bankruptcy? Yeah, I, I, it's probably a bit of both, Joe. Yeah. Um, but I suspect, as, as I say, of, of the two billion debt there, almost certainly um, there's a large amount, like at least a quarter of a million, probably closer to half a million to a million of that uh, is actually businesses that are no longer solvent. So at, at some point in the next two years, the tide is going to retreat and we will see who's wearing swimming trunks. Yeah, and we're also, I mean, we're, we're seeing high court cases recently, which you'll have seen, where, where businesses uh, are insolvent and, and examinerships are being put in place and uh, schemes of arrangement where revenue, because they warehouse the debt, uh, we're no longer a preferential debtor and mm. revenue are quite excited about that. So I think, you know, we're, we're, there's going to be a zero tolerance approach in, in terms of establishing these phase payment arrangements and, and clearing that debt. All right, OK. So uh, revenue is going to say, guys, we gave you enough time to, to sort this out. Precisely. That's why they're encouraging me. Come forward now, start the discussion now, and yeah. let's see how we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to Andrew Webb, the Chief Economist, to kind of give us an upsum. Was there anything missed in the budget from a business point of view? I mean, opposition parties will always say it's a missed opportunity. That's literally what they always say. Yeah. But was there one or two things that you said, you know what, that was low-hanging fruit. They could have done something for companies on that side of things. Y yeah, I mean... I there's some significant competitiveness challenges in the economy, and, and we all know, you know, housing's a major issue. Um, skills are becoming a major issue for for many employers. So I think a lot more could have been done on housing. I think we probably could have seen even more on uh, the skill side and, and the pull through on on economically inactive people to make employment and employability schemes more attractive. I think as well, just on the the angel investors piece, there there was probably opportunities around the the public listing space as well, the, 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 the number of listings is declining and I mean that's a, a vibrant part of the funding ecosystem for, for firms and if, if that's not there and if that's not vibrant... Are you talking are, about the Dublin you know, Euronext? Exactly that, yeah. yeah. Um, so if, if there are, I, I would have hoped to have seen some sort of incentivizing for more listings and, and I think that was a, a miss. What about something like stamp duty, could they have made that easier? That, that was one, one option, but I think as well, you know, we think about building the base of, of retail investors, which isn't, you know, if we look at other jurisdictions, we see um, ICES and tax-free stock trading accounts. And Certainly in the UK, ICES like are super popular. Yeah, so things like that, I think, could, could have really injected some energy into that public listing space, and that might have then created more of a... Uh, an energy behind that which might pull through companies to maybe list or consider listing and I think that was something that, that could have been looked at. Yeah, because we had the boss of the Dublin Stock Exchange on the show on Monday morning and he was hoping that something could be done on that side of things and it wasn't. Uh, so it's a question now whether Flutter uh, delist, they're talking about that and then there's even Ryanair saying that we might move to Brussels, yeah. which would be a huge embarrassment uh, for the Dublin Stock Exchange and others as well. Can I thank you all We've come to the end of our 50-minute uh, session. Um, I'd like to thank our previous panel, which was Mary Moran, Jarlath O'Keefe and Peter Vale, and Andrew Webb, our Chief Economist, uh, Jim Kelly, Tax Director, uh, Una Ryan, also Tax Director, and Pascal Comerford. Thank you all for joining us and have a great, great rest of the day wherever you are. And hopefully the budget hasn't been too awful for all of you. Thank you. <laughs>